But I'm so grateful to be here, so glad for the things of, uh, that are going on here in, in Albany. Uh, I do remember going through, knocking on doors. Uh, it feels good to be back here, seeing what God's done, how God's blessed this church in such a mighty way. Uh, this month is, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I just want to say you have a wonderful pastor. We love the Waldrons. Yeah, give honor where honors due. Thank you so much. for the, We love Brother and Sister Waldron. They have meant so much to us. And we, have, we appreciate them very, very much. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There is nothing like godly leadership. That leaders that will go to bat for you. Leaders that will preach truth to you. Not just tell you what you want to hear, but to tell you what you need to hear to get you through. Especially in a, in a time and an hour that we live in, we have to have ministers that are preaching truth. Not just having itching ears and just wanting to hear what we want to hear. We have to have ministers that will tell us that's what saith the word of the Lord. But I am thankful. I want to thank my pastor. I give him honor today. Thank him for letting Brother, Brother Tony, what a wonderful man of God he has been in my life. Um, but I, I cannot tell you how much the, the Waldrons mean to me and my wife. Uh, I, when I was at Bible college, he, him and, and Sister Waldron came into my life at a very pivotal moment in my life. And uh, he knows a lot of my past and what I was dealing with and what I was struggling with when I got there to Bible college. And he loved me anyway. And he ministered and he kept me and he, he just poured into me. And I can't thank you enough, Brother Waldron, for, for believing in me. He believed in me. Uh, and that meant the difference. And that, that has kept me in and kept me going. And I, I, love, I love the Waldron so dearly. Uh, if we can turn, if you would like to stand to Numbers chapter 7 and verse 1. I really do feel like the, the, word, the Lord has given me a word for us today. A word that I'd like to share and I'm not a long-winded preacher. We'll probably beat the Baptists and everybody to the restaurant, so we'll be good. But I do feel like the Lord has put, put something in my heart today. Numbers chapter 7, and we're starting in verse 1. And now we're picking up this story, and it'll explain a little bit as we get into, but they, they've already heard from the Lord. God has given the law. God has, has set up how to set up the tabernacle. He told them everything that needed to be done. He gave them all of the, the law and the commandments already. And now they're implementing it. They're, they were, we've come to a place where now this is becoming real. This is real life. This isn't just something written on a stone. This is, we're putting it together. We're, it's all built and assembled. And now they're ready to, to make their first offerings on this brand new tabernacle. On this brand new altar. They're going to they're gonna sacrifice for the first time. And so now they're setting it up. Everything's been anointed. Everything's been put together. And in verse 1 of, of chapter 7 in Numbers, it says, And it came to pass on the day Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and, and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes, and were over them that were numbered, offered. And they brought... They're offering before the Lord six covered wagons and twelve oxen. Everyone say six covered wagons, six covered and, twelve wagons. and twelve oxen. And the Bible says, and a wagon for two of the princes and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. So the princes of Israel, they, they gathered up some ox and they gathered up some wagons. And they, the Bible says that they gave them to Moses. And in, in verse number 4, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take it of them. That's a very important concept in this. Take it. Go ahead and take it. When people are offering you things, sometimes you just got to go ahead and take it. But this is important. He says, Don't just hold it for yourself. He said, Take it, that you may do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt give them. He said, Take it and give them to the Levites. To every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them unto the Levites. And I want you, this is, this is incredible. I, I missed it here, but the first time I read it. But I want you to catch this. It says, two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari according unto their service under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. And if you like to read ahead, or if you know how to do math in your head, you've probably already come up with the number, but I, I, this caught me off guard. This I didn't see coming. Because Levi had three sons. 
And obviously, if we do the math, if you have six oxen and we can 12, 12 uh, or six wagons and 12 oxen, you, you divide them evenly, everybody gets some. But we see that Marari got four wagons and eight oxen. And Gershon got two wagons and, and four oxen. And so that means... In verse 9, it says, But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none. And this is important. We can walk away angry. We can walk away upset. But this is because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray right now that you would come into this house, Lord. That you would speak, oh God, a word fitly spoken today. Lord, speak through me, Lord. Don't let me say one thing that you would not have me say, Lord. Let me preach, oh God, a word that will help. That will Let me preach your truth and love, Lord. Let us let, come down, oh God. Be with us. Be among us. Speak to us today. Touch, touch our hearts, oh God. Speak to our minds. Deliver us, oh God. Speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. He said unto the sons of Kohath, I'm not going to give any. And that, to me, it seemed a little unfair. There was enough to divide to where everyone could get equal amounts. We could get, you get two wagons and four oxen. You get two wagons and four oxen. You get two wagons and we're done. We can just wash our hands, go. Everyone has exactly what they need for the service of the tabernacle. But he said unto the sons of Kohath, I'm not giving any. And so in my mind, I thought, what's going on with, with Kohath? Was he the one that, that walked in, on, on his, in his, unto his father and he saw his nakedness and he was getting punished? No, that was not the right guy. No. Was it the guy that had an affair on another man's wife and he sent him into battle? And, no, that was a different guy. Well, did he, he must have been the least among his brethren. He must have done something so terribly wrong, something so, so just evil and wicked that his father wouldn't even get, Moses wouldn't give him any wagons or any oxen but the Bible says that he was actually a pretty good guy Come on. he ministered into the house of the Lord and what the Bible says that because of his ministry because of his calling that's why he didn't get any oxen that's why he didn't get any wagons because the things that he was to carry was to be carried on the shoulders of men it had to be carried there's some things that we do in the house of God some things we do in ministry that can be put on carts that can be carried by wagons but there are some things in ministry that can only be bore on the backs of men and women of God and God will give you the strength to carry them God will give you the strength to do what you need to do, but, but we cannot let the spirit of bitterness, the spirit of, why didn't I get my wagon? We're, we live in a handout yeah. world right now. Come on. Come on. We live in where we line up and we get what's ours and we expect it to be there. When, we, when I didn't get my Biden bucks, when they were on, I, I got upset. Mm. I, like, I need my Biden bucks. Come on. And we live in this, this, this world where we, we think that we are just... We're good enough to where we need it. We deserve it. Come on. If, if I don't get what I'm, if I'm paid to, to be here or, or to be at this place or if, I don't, if they don't take care of me like they should, then I get upset and I get offended because I look over at their ministry and they're, they're taking off and they're getting all of this help and all of this support and all of this covering. But I, where are my wagons? Where, where are my ox? Come on. What? My father must not appreciate my ministry because he didn't give me any wagons. And we allow the enemy of our souls to convince and, and destroy our mind, destroy our thinking. We allow this root of bitterness to rise up in our minds and think that somehow because we didn't get any wagons that we are somehow less than our brothers. That somehow our ministry isn't as important. And so I got to thinking, well, what was, what was Kohath's job? What were they in charge of? He must have been carrying the outhouses. Or he must have been in charge of, of taking care of the offering plates. Or something that he must have been the window washers or the vacuum cleaners. He was the one that would take care of the vacuum cleaners. That's probably what it was. And so that's why he didn't get any wagons, because he was in such a low ministry. That he wasn't taken care of because he didn't get those flashy new wagons. That he must be less than. But if we, if we turn to Numbers chapter 4 and verse 1. 
It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families by, house, by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upward, even until fifty years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath. We're going to figure it out now. We're going to figure out what this dirty job that they're, they're doing, that they don't deserve any ox, or they don't deserve any wagons. What are they doing? It must be meaningless. It must be just insignificant. The Bible says their service was to be about the most holy things. Come on, here. Come on. Their job was to carry the most holy things. And I'm telling you, maybe the reason why you didn't get an ox, and maybe the reason why you didn't get a wagon, because the burden that you carry cannot be put behind some stinking ox and on some rickety old cart, but it's to be put on the shoulders of men, but upon people with a burden to do the things of God that, that need to be placed on the shoulders. The, the sons of Kohath, their job was to carry the ark of the covenant. Their job was to carry the golden ark, the the labor. They were, their job was to carry the essential things to the tabernacle. The things that were the most holy things. The things that were the most consecrated things to the things of God. That's what had to be on the shoulders of a man. It couldn't be on some nasty wagon pulled behind some dirty ox. But a man with a burden had to get up underneath it and say, God, I'll do whatever you, you call me to do. God, I'll take the word of God wherever you want me to go. Lord, I'll speak your truth no matter where you send me. It had to be a man with a burden everything I got. I don't care if I get a wagon and I don't care if I get an oxen but I'm going to do something for the kingdom of God. I've, I've got a love for truth. i got a love for the things of God and I'm not going to give up just because I didn't get a wagon. Come on. Just because my brothers got more wagons than I did. No. That's right. But think about it on that day. Thinking about the whole congregation of Israel. All the Sons of Israel were there gathered together and it was time to get your wagon. It was time to finally get your ministry recognized. You're standing before all your brethren. And I want you to see something here. He, the Bible says he goes to the sons of Gershon. You get two wagons and four oxen. And to the sons everywhere else in Scripture... Everywhere else you in Scripture where you see them ordered by name. It was always in order of birth. It was always Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Always, except for in verse in, in chapter four where he's given out their duties, and in, in which Kohath was put first. He was called first. And only then the other time where he was not put second, what was when it was time to give out the oxen. When it was time to give out the wagons. And I can imagine, I know the scripture doesn't tell us this, but I know human nature does. I guarantee you there was one person, he knew the order. He knew, okay, it's Gershon. We're going to let him get, the, hey, good job. You guys got your two wagons. Four oxen, wonderful. Very good. You're blessed. Oh, isn't it? They're blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah. So good for my brother. And now it's our turn. Let's go, guys. Let's get our two, two oxen, or two wagons and four oxen. It's our turn. Because it's, it's Gershon, Kohath, Merari. And they're taking their step. Come on, guys. Let's go get them. And we step forward, and they say Merari instead of Kohath. After everywhere in Scripture, when they brought them together in a congregation, they would always announce Kohath second. So he was ready. His sons were ready. And it was Merari. And they're like, oh, Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah, good job, we're all right. Good job. <laughs> and there was still one, like me, that hadn't done the math yet. That hadn't figured it out. No, hey guys, we're, we're going to get ours now. It's going to be our turn. We're, we're, we're excited. It's time for us to finally get what we need to make sure we can do our, our calling. We, we're finally going to have that support system that we need to do the will of God. We're gonna make, this is going to be so much easier now that we have our wagons. And there's someone, I guarantee, you say, dude, there's, they're all gone. Like, there's, we can see them from here, and they've been all given out. There's no more for us. But he was still expecting his ox, and still expecting his wagon. And when it said, Kohath, you get none. How devastating 
he must have felt. How maybe embarrassed or envious or how come, how come Marara got double the wagons that Gershon got? Like what is he, what is he even carrying? What is he even, like, Marari carried, he carried the bars, the posts, the pillars, the boards. He carried the framework. He carried the heavy stuff. Gershon carried the cloths, the fabrics, the badger skins. And so it made sense that he only got two wagons and four oxen. But I can't believe the sons of Kohath didn't go, He's, this guy's carrying sticks. And he gets four wagons for sticks? Look at the burden that we have to carry. Look at what we're, we're struggling trying to make sure that we get this thing going and I don't get a wagon? I don't get my ministry supported? I don't get... I'm telling you, listen, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be honest. When I was at IBC, I, mean, I saw other guys' ministry thriving and taking off and, and going places where I'm like, whoa. And you can't, you can't but allow, you know, you try to fight it. But human nature goes, well, what... Come on. Why do they get those opportunities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Why, why is their ministry seeming like it's so easy? Why does it look like they, have, they don't have anything going against them? They have all put together. But what about my ministry? What about my calling? When, when am I going to get my shot in the, in the spotlight? Mm -hmm. And if we don't, if we're not careful... We can allow this root of bitterness, this misunderstanding, this, this thinking that, that we should have everything handed out to us, everything just easy. And if you get into this in your mind where you think just because you got in church, life's going to be hunky-dory. No, things get real. <laughs> you get, but the thing is, you have now a real God that is there and that He can keep you and He can sustain you and He can protect you. Before that, you were on your own. But God is able to uplift and He's able to carry. Even if you don't get a wagon and even if you don't get an oxen, God is still able. God is still strong. His hand can still reach down and pick you up when you're lost and when you're undone. And when God is able, and God can deliver, and God can keep. Amen. Even when it seems like your, your name wasn't called when it should have been. When you were next in line, and, and your brother got what you were meant to have. If you don't realize, though, if you, if you skip over the part, that, the part that you're supposed to carry, that ministry that you have, it, it can only be carried. It can only be carried on the shoulders of men. Yes. There's no other way. No. Think when David, when he was trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant after it had been lost, after it had been captured, and now they were able to get the Ark of the Covenant, and they're trying to bring it back into the city of David. He said, you know what I'm going to do? Without, without consulting the Word of God, without trying to figure out how it should have been carried, this is a man after God's own heart. This is a man that ha seemingly now had it all together. He said, I got an idea. We're going to put this on a, on a new cart. Because the Ark of the Covenant is so important and it's so special that it belongs on a new cart. And we, we need to, we, this is the way we should carry it. This is the way it ought to be carried. And no, no doubt the sons of Kohath thought when, when it was time to get out carts that they should have had one. Because the, the Ark of the Covenant deserves it. And so David had this, this mentality that we should put it on a new cart. But he had no idea that the most holy things had to be and could not be carried any other way than on the shoulders of men. Oh, yeah. And it took a man reaching out and, and touching the Ark of the Covenant and dying before they realized that this could only be shouldered on the backs of men and it had to be carried a certain way because this was the Ark of the Covenant. This was the most holy thing that we have. Come on. And so as we, we turn into this new generation where everything's going online and everything is, is seeming like it has a new thing and a new wagon, and I, just like with the, with the ark, or just like with the things of the tabernacle, there are a lot of things that can be put on wagons. Hmm. There's a lot of parts of ministry that do deserve just put them on a wagon. Let's get it, let's get it modernized. Let's make it look good. We can, we can change our, our methods. 
But we can never put this message on some old stinking wagon and trying to make it look new and try to make it, make it seeker friendly and as long as it makes everybody feel good, then we can preach it or we, we can't preach it if it's against something that's not... No, he said this is something that can only be on the shoulders of men, only... Come on, come on, preach it, Noah. Yes, no. That's good. Yes, we should modernize. Yes, we should look good. Yes, but th this, this holy message that we have, this separation from the world, this baptism in Jesus' name, this walk that we have, this, the most holy things of God cannot be put on some stinking cart. they got to be carried by men and women that are separate from the world, that have, that have said, God, I, I'm going to do what you call me to do. If not, I promise you, if we put the ark in a place where it doesn't belong, someone's going to reach out and touch it, and they shouldn't have. Mm. And we'll see people die and die and die. Mm. Souls lost because we didn't put the ark where it belonged. I have friends that go to these churches, these, these, these mega churches. I've seen friends I went to Bible college walk away from the truth, walk away to go into this new cart. Come on. And they have died spiritually. Mm. They have, their marriages are in, end up in divorce. They're, they're, they're lost and then they're undone because they didn't realize that a lot of this that we do can go in a car. Yeah, we can put the, the bars and the, we can put the posts and the pillars and we can put the badger skins and we can put those things on carts. That's fine. But the Holy Ghost, mm. holiness, separation, those things got to be on our shoulders. We, we can't try to make up some new thing to get us into heaven. But this, this word that we have, it's got to be put in our heart that we might not sin against God. we got to be careful where we put the most holy things. Amen. And that man that, I, that I, I think was there, and the Bible says that all the sons of Kohath were there. I'm going to read this. Numbers chapter 16 and verse 1. That man, I think, that really allowed a root of bitterness to come into his heart that moment. It had to have been standing there because he, all the sons of Kohath were there. The Bible says, Now Korah the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath. Kor was Kohath's grandson, the son of Levi. He was there that day that he got overlooked and he didn't get his cart when he thought everyone else got their cart. Why didn't... I get my cart. And I know the scripture doesn't say that. I'm, I'm, I'm no, I, I hope I'm not, I don't want to preach this out of context, but he was there. And something got in his heart that day. Because we see it come out in verse 16, or in, in chapter 16. And he gets together some men, and they rose up before Moses was certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together and against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, this is how I know, this is how I know Korah felt like he was slighted, that he felt like he didn't get what he was, that was coming to him. Because he tells Moses, he said, ye take too much upon you. Seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. I promise you, a man that thinks some other, that his pastor or the man of God in his life has too much is a man that thinks he didn't get enough. Come on, come on. A man that, that rebels against the leadership in his life and he tells them that they got too much, he thinks that he didn't get enough. Come on. And we, can't, we have to be careful because that, that, that idea, that mindset that we, we deserve more, we, we, we should get, I'm entitled to more. Come on. I'm carrying the Ark of the Covenant. My leader must have messed up. 
The preacher in my life, the priest in my life, Moses and Aaron, they, they, they must have made a mistake. They must have took too much for themselves. Mm. And Korah led a rebellion that day. He led a rebellion that day against his leadership. He drove men against his leadership because he thought he didn't get enough. That he was slighted. That I should, where was my ox and where was my wagon? And, and listen, I get it. Like when they, something happens between Numbers chapter 7 and Numbers chapter 16. And I think really made a, a difference in Korah's mind. Because the children of Israel, they sent out spies into the promised land in chapter 14 of Numbers. And the spies, they came back with a negative report. Ten of them did. And they decided that we are not going to take over the promised land, that God somehow wasn't going to make a way, even though He brought us out of Egypt, and even though He brought us through the wilderness, and even though He brought us through the Red Sea on dry ground, I don't believe that He can help us against these, these, these men are so much bigger than we are. There's no way our God can deliver us from this. And so this, this concept that their God wasn't big enough, God in their heart and mind, and now, though, instead of this burden that, that Korah had to carry the Ark of the Covenant, it was just a few more weeks. He's like, okay, they got their wagons. I'll carry it on my shoulder. No big deal. We're going to be in the promised land. No time at all. But when those few weeks turned into 40 years, and Korah's like, I'm going to have to do what? I'm going to wander in the wilderness with no wagon having to carry this burden for 40 years with no help, with no support, with not getting what I deserved. Hmm. And so now this becomes more than, than Korah can take. And he looks at his leadership and he says, you're wrong. And you've put too much on yourself. Isn't the whole congregation holy? Shouldn't we all be able to do this? Shouldn't you guys messed up? Because a little bit of bitterness, because he didn't, he felt slighted, changed his outlook on his leadership. This now sentence of carrying something on his shoulders, this burden now for 40 years, and just instead of just of a few weeks, it changed him. In Numbers chapter 16, 8 through 10, Moses pleads with them. He falls before their face. When they bring this accusation, he falls before his, on his face. And he says, we, we, you can't do this. And, he, and he, he tells Korah this. And Moses said unto Korah, Hear, I pray you, son of Levi, Seem it, it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to Himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and to minister unto them. And He, and he hath brought thee near to Him and all thy brother and the sons of Levi with thee and seek ye the priesthood also. He said, Korah, do you see him as a small thing that God has brought you out from among your brethren? Do you think it's just a little thing? And I want to preach just for a few moments today. Don't belittle your burden. Don't belittle your burden the thing that God has put on your heart the things that you God has promised you don't let the devil don't let the enemy of this world don't let don't let bitterness in, to make you think you're insignificant or think that that thing isn't going to come to pass or think that somehow you're, that God isn't looking after you just because you didn't get the handouts that everybody else did just because it hasn't been as easy for you as it's been for everybody else don't belittle your burden Moses looked at him and he said, You think it's a small thing 
that God has called you out to minister. And when you think that what you're doing and what you're a part of is just a small, insignificant thing, just something you allow the, the enemy of your soul to belittle the things of God in your life. We cannot let the enemy of our soul belittle holiness in our life. We cannot let the enemy of our soul make it seem a small thing that we're separate from the world and that we've been called out from among them and be you separate. That he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We cannot look at God and the things of God and make them look seem small and insignificant just because we didn't get what we thought we deserved. Hurt you, Cora is struggling now with this feeling of being slighted. He now leads people away from their leadership. 14,700 people dead because of a rebellion led by a man that thought he should have got some wagons. So I looked up what Cora, what his name meant. Cora literally means bald. I was hoping well, it would be a little more than that, but it meant bald. But the root word of his name means to plight. To, that's, it means to make bald, to deplete or diminish. Deplete means using of supply or resources of. Another synonym of deplight is to disburden, to remove, to lessen or lower, to reduce, to diminish, to belittle. There was something, a root in Korah, that had an ability to, to reduce things, to lower things, to, to make the thing that he was working on seem less than what his brothers were working on because they got all the nice things and I didn't get what I was supposed to get. I didn't get handed out what I thought I should have deserved. And he belittles something in his life and it destroys him. And it destroys the people that followed him. We cannot in this last day lessen the things of God, these most holy things of God, these things that they have to be bore on the backs and on our shoulders of people that are in the prayer room fasting. Prayer, there's no substitute for prayer, fasting and reading the Word of God. There's no shortcut for the, the apostolic movement that we have. There's no shortcut. There's no making it easier. Sometimes you just got to get in a prayer room and pray until God makes it happen. You just got to work until you see it done. You got to just carry that burden. Let's go. This is uh, in Numbers chapter 4 through 15. This struck me so, so to my core. Numbers chapter 4 and verse 15 is instructing Aaron and his sons. They're given the duties to, to Kohath. And the Bible says that Aaron and their sons, they need to make an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary as the camp is to set forth and set forward. And then it says, After that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. It was the sons of Kohath's job to wait outside until everything had been covered up by the sons of Aaron. So now imagine that. A burden that you'll carry for 40 years. And you never get a chance to even see it. They never even got a look at the Ark of the Covenant. When they got to it, it was covered in badger skins and in a blanket 
It was already covered up. They would never see it. And mothers, you may never see those children get back into church. And fathers, you may never see those kids get back. To what you need to still carry that burden. You need to put it on your shoulders. There may, there may be some things that happen in Albany that we may never see with our own eyes. But we cannot leave it up to what we see. We walk by faith and not by sight. And even though we don't see it, and even though it's covered up, and even though it's the most holy thing, and we may never even touch it or see it, we still need to walk by faith faith, caring and knowing that God has it all under control, that God has it, He is carrying us, He is guiding us, He is leading us, even though we can't see it doesn't mean God doesn't see it, doesn't mean we may never see it until we get on the other side of Jordan, until we make heaven our home, we may never see it, but God only knows, and we need to carry it even when we can't see it. Oh, oh man. Let's go. There may never be a cart for Kohath. There may be, your ministry may never be seen by you, but God sees it. God knows the ways that you take. Don't allow bitterness, don't allow envy and strife to destroy the things of God in your life. Just carry it. God will give you strength. Put it on your shoulders and bear it. Carry it, and I promise you, God will get you through to the other side. God's got it under control. It's God's. It's all God's anyway. And He's called you to this for such a time as this. Don't let something as small as not getting a cart keep you from walking into the, the promised land. Walking into where now you can rejoice because you've now entered into where God has called you to be. And I told you I wouldn't preach long. Joshua, we can all stand. Joshua chapter 3 and verse, in verse 15. I wonder if Korah would have known about this moment. If he would have foreseen this moment, maybe he would have made a different decision. Maybe he would have changed his mind. Maybe he wouldn't have led a rebellion. Joshua chapter 3 and verse, and verse 15. It said, And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan. This is now when they're entering into the promised land. They've, they've wandered. They've, they've, that whole generation died in the wilderness. And now those that, that were young enough now to enter in. The Bible said that they, they told them to, to let the ark of the covenant pass before Israel. Through the whole congregation of Israel, let that ark go before them. Yes. And verse 15 says, and, and as they that bear the ark, this is the sons of Kohath. Korah could have been here if he wouldn't have, if they wouldn't have not gone into the promised land when they should have. Mm. If he wouldn't have led a rebellion, maybe he would have seen the next generation be able to do this. Yes. You never know. Come on. But now they're stepping across to the promised land. Yes. And I know his, his name was called out last when it was time to get the carts. But now, stepping into the promised land, Lord. it says, Let them that bear the ark come unto Jordan. <laughs> and that the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest, mm -hmm. that the waters which came down from above stood arose up upon the heap very far from the city Adam, mm -hmm. that it beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Maybe that burden that God has put on your heart, 
Maybe that calling that God has given you. I know it seemed like you were put in last place when it came to get the ox and it came to get the wagon. But the Bible says that the, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And these sons of Kohath were the first ones to dip their feet into the Jordan. And because they were able to carry that burden, because they were carrying the most holy things, the Jordan dried up and they were able to walk. And the Bible says that all of the Israelites passed clean. Yes. Yeah over Jordan. Oh, yeah. Maybe that calling that God put on you so that your brother and your sister can make it through this clean. That they can make it through this holy. That they can make it over to the other side untouched by the things of this world. This, this stuff that we carry. The most holy things that we carry. These standards. This way of life. The, the love that we have for God's truth. These can only be carried on the shoulders of men. And if you don't give up. If you don't get bitter. If you don't allow the things of this world to consume your mind. You can allow others to walk clean over Jordan. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this place, oh God. Don't allow, oh God, any bitterness or any in malcontent, anything that would try to rise up in our heart just because we feel like we didn't get a wagon, oh God. You've called us for a higher purpose. Lord, we're not, we're not insignificant because we didn't get a wagon, oh God, but you've called us to the most holy things, oh God. Yes, Strengthen us today. Lord, remind us of this holy call. Yes. Don't let us belittle this burden, oh God. Don't let us make it seem like a small thing that we have separation, oh God. Oh my God. Don't let it be a small thing in our mind that we've been called out to be a part of a ministry doing something for the kingdom of God. Oh my God. Lord, we don't let us ever try to change the word of God. Don't let us ever try to change this message, oh God. Yes. Let us keep it always on the backs of men and women, holy men and women that are willing to do the things that you've called them to do. Lead and guide us, oh God. Lord, sometimes we don't get a wagon, but don't let us get bitter, oh God. Lord, keep us, strengthen us today. Lord, realign our mind, realign our thinking. Let us be grateful, oh God, for what you've called us to do. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Hallelujah, hallelujah. These altars are open if you'd like. If, I don't know how you are doing with, with COVID or whatever you guys are doing, but you guys come and, and pray. Where you or pray, Turn your seat into an altar and pray that God guards our hearts, that God, God leads our minds, that God re, re, gives us a love for the burden that he's given us, that he, he magnifies this burden in our heart, that we find a love for it, that we thank him, that we get to carry the things, the most holy things to people. People, so we can allow others to cross on dry ground. Yes. Lord, we were last when it was time to give out ministry, oh God, but we will be first when we walk into the kingdom of, into your kingdom, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.